Who is Eddie Palmieri, you don't need to ask. Born in East Harlem and raised in the Bronx, he began playing timbales professionally at age 13 and formed his first band on Perfecta in 61. Working for over 50 years at the explosive vein where jazz and afro caribbean music merged, Mr. Palmieri is a treasure of American vernacular music, a transformative musician traversing cultures, moving among idioms, going past boundaries to create sounds of passion, joy, beauty, and ecstasy. He's won nine Grammys, including the first ever Grammy for Best Latin Jazz Album, a category for music. He has close to 40 albums to his credit, and every time he comes to the Bay Area, I'm in the audience. Now, the hard part of the introduction. Weeks after my father died in 1981, I took my Cuban mother, a teacher in East Harlem, who raised a family in the Bronx, and filled her home with the music of Celia Cruz, Benny More, Arsenio Rodriguez, Cachao, and in a slightly different vein, Chabela Vargas. I took my Cuban mother to see Mr. Palmieri perform in a series called Salsa Meets Jazz at the Village Gate. And the music helped bring her back to the land of the living. Three decades later, in her own dying days, in her final dream states, she spoke only Spanish and began to repeat as if chanting, tango que baile, tango que baile, tango que baile. I played her some of Mr. Palmieri's performances on YouTube, and they brought the flicker of a smile to her face. His music and images of Cuba in the 40s may have been the last sounds she took with her to the other side. Mr. Palmieri said some, somewhere that, quote, when the orchestra is in sync, it's like one mind thinking. You feel that the band is going to disappear, and I'm, go and I'm just going to find their shoes. It's a sublime situation. I thank him for myself, and for, for my, mo my mother, and for many others of us for many such sublime experiences. We're honored today also to have in conversation with Mr. Palmieri, the Bay Area's own John Santos. Sublime Conguero, band leader, composer, producer, and extraordinary teacher, also four-time Grammy nominee, resident director of SF Jazz, and a member of the Latin Jazz Advisory Committee of the Smithsonian Institution, Mr. Santos is one of the foremost practitioners and exponents of Afro-Latin music in the world today. He was born in San Francisco and was raised in the Puerto Rican and Cape Verdean traditions of his family. I have tickets to see him at SF Jazz on March 23rd, and you should too. <laughs> And also, please check out his new album, if we still use that word, Filosofia Caribeña. With that, let's welcome Eddie Palmieri and John Santos. Thank you very much, Alan. I cannot uh, begin to explain to you what a thrill it is for me to be up here on the stage with this gentleman. I want to thank uh, Alan, Teresa, Colleen, all the folks from the Townsend Center for inviting me to be part of this historic occasion. Um, for me, uh, Eddie Palmieri has been my teacher, just like he is for anybody who is uh, a student or a fan or a practitioner of this kind of music, Afro-Caribbean music. And uh, he's a genius. He really is. He's a very humble gentleman. And I hope I don't embarrass him up here because I'm going to be probably gushing. I can't help myself. But um, Mr. Palmieri has taught so many generations of us that um, his legacy is just unmatched. And it's, it's going strong, stronger than ever right now. As we speak, he's got new CDs coming out, new projects, and new things brewing all the time. So for me, it's a, it's a great honor to be able to uh, have a conversation with Eddie, with all of you. We're going to uh, have a little bit of a conversation. I'm going to set it up with, a, f I want to say a few things, and we're going to have a few questions for him. And then uh, we're going to do something that uh, some of you, I I'm sure, may or may not know what it is. And uh, it's called a blindfold test. And um, Blindfold Test is something that Downbeat Magazine, I think, instigated in the 40s, where uh, they would take an artist and play for him or, him or her <coughs> some music without <coughs> telling them what it is and get the comments. And so um, that has been wonderful and sometimes disastrous because of the comments of some people make. But I think this is going to be uh, cool because I'm not trying to trick him or anything like that. The point is not to see uh, if he can guess who it is, although that's, you know, he'll be doing that, but to get his comments on the music and then the musicians. Um, the re one, one of the things that I want to point out is that this idea of doing a blindfold test live on stage, I believe, was created by a, a friend of mine, Dan Ouellette, who's a great uh, writer, a, a journalist who used to work here and live here in the Bay Area for many years. 
and then started doing the blindfold test live on stage at the Monterey Jazz Festival and other places. And it's, uh, it was wonderful. I saw him live. I saw him uh, interview Paquito, Paquito de Rivera, Charlie Hayden, Freddie Hubbard. It was always wonderful to hear what the artists had to say about the music. So we're going to get to that as well. And then we're going to have a Q&A. We'll have about 10 or 15 minutes to take questions from you uh, at the end. So hold on to your questions for that. Um, to set up, I, I, I want to say that uh, on one occasion, on a, a blindfold test that Mr. Palmieri did, uh, Dan played him a piece of my music, and he didn't know who it was, but he was very complimentary. I was like, I was very lucky about that. He was, uh, and he made a comment that was one of the greatest uh, compliments I've ever had in my life. He said that uh, John Santos, it lives in my heart and pays no rent. And I, 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 that's like, that's the highest compliment I've ever received. So I really appreciate that. And, um, I want to ask you that you and, and, and Eddie um, indulge me at this point because when I read that, his comment, it inspired me to write something that expresses how I feel about the gentleman. And it kind of is it, to forego reading a bio or something. You already heard a little bit of a bio, but this shows a little bit about um, my reaction to his reaction. Um, Eddie knows I love him like an uncle. He knows I'm a fan and admirer. He doesn't know that recordings such as Live at the Palladium from 1959 and Azucar from 1964 from my father's record collection were staples in our household. I had to repurchase both records due to premature baldness, that is to say, no grooves left on the disc. <laughs> he doesn't know that Cuidate Compay and Mi Soncito were essential elements in our home, like a subliminal soundtrack that accompanied our youth. I never lived in the same city as Eddie, nor even on the same coast, but that unmistakable sound permeated my childhood. He doesn't know that when he played in San Francisco sometime in the very early 1970s, there was at least one teenager in the audience who had an epiphany and happened to look a lot like me. Nor is he aware of the innumerable times I've happily laid down in front of that herd of stampeding elephants to be physically smothered and spiritually cleansed by total immersion in his sound and rhythm, whether live or plastered in front of a stereo system. His traditional sensibility, divine phrasing, superb compositions and arrangements, high danceability, social commentary and consciousness, eclectic and experimental tendencies, and downright urban funk taught us what it means to be a complete artist. Eddie who? The kid brother of that beloved piano stylist known as Charlie, who could have easily been intimidated out of music entirely but not this young man, a radical traditionalist pirate descended from Corsos who made Puerto Rico one of their Caribbean pillage points and Puerto Ricanos out of Quilichinis, Barletas, Franciscinis, and Palmieris. <laughs> young Eddie's light was recognized at the end of the 50s by Mambo royalty in the form of Tito Rodriguez as the newcomer prophetically established his trademark range in traditional contemporary duality, summed up in two pieces from the first recording, Mamahuela and El Moldo de las Locas. Independence was eminent for the young revolutionary. His early 60s trombanga was the cream of the crop, not only putting the trombone on what came to be the permanent salsa map, but along with Manny, Tommy, Barry, Jose, Ismael, David, and George, taking us on a timeless ride of immense sabor, which is far from over. When he sits at the piano, centuries of rhythm and spirit coalesce in an immediately identifiable trance-inducing sound, invoking congos con sus macutas, Lucumis y sus bembés, carabalis with their bricamos and ancient boricuas with their buleadores and their yubas to rush in front, to rush in from their distant eras and dwellings, marking their firmas on the ground with ritual pasos. If their shoes were made of chalk, the floor would be filled with hieroglyphic secrets of transcendental life that the egum babalawos tatas, infumbes, and curanderos constantly communicate to us through choreography and rhythm. Even his name is musical, Palmieri, Eddie, Palmieri. The young man was undaunted and uncontainable. No record company, commercial standards, reactionary political factions, stages, or dancing publics could hold him back as his alchemy brewed out of the New York City and across the continents. 
He synthesized styles, syncretized religions, destroyed barriers with the force of a mighty celestial army on Mozambique chariots, whose otherworldly combination of guttural utterances, ancestral cantos, and relentless rhythm strikes fear in the weak and divides the rest of us into the spellbound and those who dance like we've never danced before, soaked and wondering what just happened to us when the tune ends. Eddie, you were the son of Latin music, an immortal beacon of light, a cosmic prince, a powerful vortex among a court of brujos where Lopez, Peruchin, Noro, Ruen, Lili, Prado, Bebo, Thelonious, McCoy, Powell, Palmieri, and others funnel their magic. If I live in your heart and pay no rent, your kingdom is humanity's hope and, imagine, and, and imagination where you live forever. There's no way to thank you, Maestro. Palmieri, Eli, Palmieri. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me like that. And uh, Eddie, I have a message for you also. I, you know, this morning, uh, a few of your ex-band members and people who have played with you before and who, to whom you were also a mentor, when they found out I was going to do this and be here with you, they said to be sure to give you a, a saludo. Eddie Resto, former bass player. Wow. Oscar Hernandez, the leader of the Spanish Harlem Orchestra, and Juan Gutierrez, the director of the Pleneros de la Ventiuna. So, saludos wow. cordiales. Wow. Eh, en esto, Después de lo que ha hablado este bravo de mí, eh, ¿lo podemos oír? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, after what uh, Mr. Santos has said about me, I think we should just say good night. <laughs> and thank you for, for coming here. And let's get back to the wine bottles. Uh, Mr. John Santos, to me, is uh, so, so special. He is in my opinion, the complete future of our genre that, in my opinion, has uh, totally gone away. The great pioneers are all gone, you know. Uh, commercial radio does not play our music, which makes it impossible for the youngsters or the young players to know what we're talking about. Uh, if it's, the, the word is, if you ain't writing right, it's because you ain't rapping right, you know? So everything has to do is rap and, and hip hop and whatever, and, and, and there's nothing wrong in none of that. But you have to give us an equal shot on the radio, and, that, and we haven't had that for many, many years. And that's been a disaster to our personal dance genre. The art of the dance itself is totally disintegrated. So someone like John Santos to me, on the other coast, 3,000 miles away, uh, all I could send him is my prayers for his health, for his vision, for his uh, intuitive, you know, work, his musical work, the recordings that he does, uh, what he has accomplished here, how he's so well loved here in California, Berkeley, Oakland, makes no difference. Uh, he has the highest degree of respect for me and from all the gentlemen that know about uh, how important it is to take our music forward. Uh, we can count on someone like John Santos, and I'm quite honored in my heart. He might have to start paying rent soon because things are going a little, you know, rents are going up, right? <laughs> but Mr. John Santos uh, lives in my heart, and I wish him the very best always because He's quite an incredible artist and very important to our genre. Thank you. Muchas gracias, maestro. Muchas gracias. Well, um, and by the way, I hate the blindfold test. <laughs> That's why I'm talking I was about especially hating it. <laughs> I'm especially honored that you would trust me enough to, to go through this because I had to talk him into it. 
I had to talk him into it. He was not into it. He had a couple of experiences that were less than uh, pleasant around the blindfold test, and he still trusted me to do this with him. So thank you for that. I want to start with just going back to the be beginning to give a little bit of context. As um, Alan mentioned, you were born in New York and grew up in the Bronx. And uh, you know, what are your earliest musical memories, and, and what did the Bronx mean to you in terms of Latin and non-Latin, and the fact that you had black and Jewish and Italian communities? doing their separate thing, but at what point and how did they overlap and how did they come together as audience and as players? I don't remember. <laughs> okay, question at, at number 26, two. At 26, I don't remember. Uh, Chocolate Mintero taught me that after 50, you start counting by one. So now I'm 26. Uh, my brother, Charlie Palmieri, was certainly my uh, inspiration. My mother left Puerto Rico in 1925, arrived in New York in 1925. My father arrived in 26 because my grandmother couldn't stand my grandfather and chased him all over Ponce with a broom. <laughs> and my grandmother always had businesses of cooking, all right? And uh, my, grand my mother eventually leaves. She comes on a, on a boat called El Cuamo which was eventually sunk by the Germans in World War II because uh, they, they had uh, uh, made it a, a, to transport troops, okay? My father arrived in a, uh, a freighter. They were all freighters then, you know. There was no carnival cruises and that. You know. And uh, he came in what called in Puerto Rico, P-O-R-T-O, -O, okay? And uh, they married in New York in 26. My brother Charlie was born 27. And I was born nine years later. You know, I was like a, a blessing because uh, my mother thought she would never have another child. She went through tremendous problems with my brother. And then I popped up, you know. So it was my mother who put my brother on the piano. My brother, to me, was Deep. My brother was a genius, in my opinion. He was the greatest pianist in our genre. Uh, he was the pianist, and to me, I'm the piano player, you know? And he was my main influence, and then eventually, he would recommend me to different bands, but when he would come home, he would come home with the records of the great orchestras, you know, from the Dorsey Brothers to, uh, uh, you know, you name them of that era, plus the uh, Carl Basie or Duke Ellington, really, earlier. Uh, uh, the trombone player, what's his name? That uh, Juan Tiso. No, the, that had the American, the, the, the- Tommy Dorsey. The other trombone player. Oh, him. Uh, <laughs> So they made a movie with him. Glenn Miller. Glenn Miller. Glenn Miller. So my brother would bring these records of the great bands, but plus, remember that the Machino Orchestra started in 1939, and uh, it went to the, into the 40s. The only problem that they had is that Machino eventually went to the army, they got another vocalist, and Mario Bausa, his brother-in-law, kept the band going. 1939, up. You had uh, Miguelito Valdez, who had been recording with uh, Xavier Cougar, Xavier Cougar, and he made his move. You know, it was a worldwide uh, phenomenon. Uh, you had uh, Noro Morale, the great Puerto Rican pianist. You had uh, Marcelino Guerra, La Segunda Voz Rapinde de Cuba. Y él hizo su orquesta también, Julian Dino. This is all in the 40s, okay? So I heard, and I would hear what I heard, but I was still too young. When my brother joins Tito Puente's band, because my brother was playing in the Copacabana, where Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin started, my brother was in that orchestra, the Latin orchestra there, and he played, from there he went, he helps Tito with the Piccadilly boys to go to the Palladium. The Palladium becomes 
the most incredible dance studio, I mean dance uh, uh, ballroom, because it was a, it was a dance studio, you know? Uh, and Federico Pagani, the great promoter, whose son was pa uh, uh, Papi Pagani, was the first one to bring the Machido Orchestra to Manhattan, mid Manhattan. As long as we stood up, uptown, which meant El Barrio, we were fine. But when we started to bring the Puerto Rican and the blacks were starting to come into Manhattan, then eventually they did a terrible thing and created the cabaret card. The cabaret card meant that if you had any problems with the police, you couldn't work anywhere that they serve liquor. So it, it affected tremendously the jazz musician, uh, Miles Davis, uh, Dexter Gordon. What year was that? Oh, that's going into the 50s now. You know, because the Palladium opens up in 1949. But when Federico brings Machito, the place gets packed. And it used to be a dance studio. Now Mr. Jaime, who's from the garment center, <coughs> excuse me, uh, my body's telling me that I'm the healthiest guy at this moment. Uh, he brings in Machito. He, uh, Mr. Hyman comes from the garment center. His wife is an heir to the oldest elevators, some money they had. But now when Federico brings this place and it's packed, Mr. Hyman says it's too many blacks. You know? And it's a great statement that comes from Federico. And he says, you like black or green? <laughs> Te gusta lo negro o el lo verde? Que lo verde era lo billete. The money. So his wife said, he's right. And that's how the palladium starts. Then Tito comes in with the Piccadilly boys. My brother helps him, goes back to the Copacabana. But then in World War, the, the, the Korean War, uh, Gilbert Lopez goes to the war just like uh, Frankie Colón, Conga. So now el conjunto de Tito Puente está Vicentico Valde cantando. Tamanio Kendo en el bongo. Tamongo Santa Maria en la tumbadora. Ta, hay tres trompetas. Y está Charlie Palmieri en el piano con el bajista Pacho. Cosa seria. I mean, it's serious, you know. Tito Rodriguez tiene a Monchito Muñoz, Little Ray Romero, y uno que se llama Chonguito, que después se tira para Cuba cuando entra Fidel y va a cumplir una promesa que le hizo a su madre. So he goes back to Cuba. Pero los conjuntos between Machito, Tito Puente, y Tito Rodriguez, because in 1947, 40, Llega René Hernández, que era el genio de los genios, como es cierto yo de Lili Martínez, que se quedó en Cuba. René Hernández viene de la orquesta, la última. Eh, Pero en inglés, aquí en inglés. Este, eh, Julio, eh, Julio Cueva. Grabó con otro, pero Julio Cueva es una orquesta que René le está escribiendo. Llega, he gets to Puerto Rico, I mean, excuse me, to, to New York, and he elevates the Machido Orchestra to a level that they would have never had reached if they had received the first pianist that they sent for, which was Pedro Chin. Pedro Chin would have sounded like the Riverside, which was great and that, but it wasn't what Rene and I, Rene and I was truly a genius. He wrote for everybody and differently. Vicentico Valde, Tito Puente, La Playa, me, myself. I mean, you won't believe he was a genius guy. He was a genius, for sure. So now that's 47, the era. 47 now, right? That's the, going into, four, no, going into 49, 50 now. Oh, you're going into, yeah, Channel Postal arrives 48. That's when he, that's when he meets uh, Dizzy Gillespie. And we're going 48, right in there, everything. Arsenio's there, 
I mean, uh, uh, Olga Guillón is there, Tino Rodriguez. Remember, the Tino Rodriguez and Tino Puente, they worked with the Jose Cobello band together. Then they become the arch enemies later. But that was the year that everything is really put together. And I'm a young man. I'm listening to all of this. But playing stickball in the Bronx, La Bodega would be playing these records, commercial radio, which doesn't exist anymore. So it was like the soundtrack for stickball. Machito, Tito Rodriguez, oh, Tito Puente, going into the whole 50s. Because I started professionally in 1955. So you saw a few things in the Bronx. Huh? You saw a couple of things in the Bronx. Oh, I, 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 not only that, but I was able to meet uh, someone like Manuel Kendo, and I asked him when I was 15, could you recommend, le puedes recomendar un solo de piano, a solo piano, piano solo, that I should listen to? And he told me, uh, El viejo socarrón, Lili Martini, que grabó con eh, el conjunto modelo. And man, you see the same way you made my records go to the other side? I made the same with viejo socarrón, un solo de piano, and then Lili Martini turned out to be the greatest pianist that comes out of Cuba. You had Lino Fria, you had uh, Jesus, López. Jesus López, you know? You had, uh, who I said that, I said that with the, uh, can we respect him so much? Ruin. The one that was with the, the, uh, the Buena Vista Social Club. Ruben Gonzalez. Ruben Gonzalez. Uh, Pepe Delgado, who played with uh, 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 Casino. Uh, where he played with the Nilo uh, Sosa, something, Nilo oh. Sosa. Oh. Uh, he's the first one that did Tremendo Combat. In '48, and oh, he yeah. was a piano, the pianist and the arranger. That was Pedro I mean, you know, I mean, it is a cosa seria, you know. Lo que salió de Cuba es lo que era, no, you know. So después, eh, I, I just, I, I kept going and listening and listening to, well, you know, as I was going on. And my brother recommended me to different bands, you know. And then in '56 is where he recommends me to Vicentico about this. And there's where I learned the Cuban structure. And it's in 56, it's a paonetto. It's que aprendo la música de Cuba, que Mario Kendo me trajo 25, 78, de las diferentes orquestas, la charanga, la orquesta de Benny More, de todo el mundo escuchando los pianistas. Y ahí aprendo yo a atacar el piano con Vicentico Valdez. Beautiful. Well, you know, I know why Eddie is defaulting to Spanish over here. And it's because of the presence of a guest that we have here. We have a gentleman here in the audience who we're very uh, honored to have here. And uh, I want to acknowledge him. He's part of a royal family from, of Cuban musicians. Uh, it's, a lot of you have seen him before in the Roots of Rhythm uh, documentary that Harry Balafonte was the host of about 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, his father was a pioneer of Cuban music starting in the 20s. His father was responsible for bringing the tres, a typical Cuban instrument, to Puerto Rico for the first time with a group called Sexteto Matancero in 1929. And his brother currently is with his little brother, his baby brother, is with the Buena Vista Social Club playing the tres. And I'm speaking of a great vocalist, one of the greatest, who's here for the very first time in the United States. We're honored to have Mr. Ernesto Oviedo. <laughs> I know that's why Eddie's default. I said it won't go. <laughs> well, Eddie, I'm going to take a left turn with you right now. And um, there's something that the people who know about your music um, are, know about this, about you. But I think, like me, wondering what your take is on it. And uh, you're one of the loudest hummers you, when you play. When you play, oh. you, you groan and you, you know, on the recordings, if you're ever wondering what that was, you might have wondered if you didn't know. And you hear the beautiful Eddie Pondetti recording, you hear the solo, and you hear in the background, and you hear this moaning, and it's Eddie, it's Eddie's voice. But let me tell you how it happened. Uh -huh. My first recording for Allegri, my brother recommends me to Al Santiago, and Al Santiago gives me my first uh, uh, recording. 
which is the one under the white stone bridge with the 36 Dodge, the Milota Chiqui Pere. Mm -hmm. I have three bands there. Four trumpets, Cajunto, four trumpets, the two trombones, and then just trombone and flute as the budget kept dwindling off. Okay. <laughs> so now I'm recording, and all of a sudden, Al Santiago says, oh, Hola, hola, para ahí, que es, que, que es el ruido, and, and you know, what is that noise, you know? And we start looking, and everybody's looking around the studio. <laughs> and, uh, you didn't even realize it. Nobody realized it. <laughs> the main thing is to make a long story short, cuando se dieron cuenta en esto que era yo, cuando toco, haciendo, ah, el congo, el congo por dentro, moviéndose loco, ah. Uh -huh. Ahora, no sabían qué hacer, so, tapa. Primero, antes de tapar el piano, me quería meter. They wanted to tape. My, <laughs> they wanted to put duct tape on me. I mean, I was, I was going to become the first, like, like the, 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 the piano is almost to relate to the mummy, you know, the movies that they were doing. The mummy walks again, or the mummy plays piano. And, and that was going to work. And then they covered the, the, the piano. They did so many things for it, it not to come out right. until they got to the point in the end you're not going to be able to stop them. que grite lo que quiera no te pone. Después que grabe bien, and that's how it turned out. That's beautiful. I, you know, uh, it sounds like you went the other direction, like to. But you know who did that also? Uba. Oh, yeah. El timbalero de, de Machito. Uh -huh. Uh, 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 and Collazo, uh, got it from Uwa. I do it too. But I, but and, it and Bobby Rodriguez, <laughs> Bobby Rodriguez, you know. It's like you get yeah. your own ambience, like, yeah. you know, when you're playing, yeah. and, you know. He said, well, he mentioned in Spanish, you, you may or may not have caught that. He said that's a Congo spirit inside of him that's expressing himself. <laughs> And I think that you reacted, you, you went in the other direction because it sounds like on a couple of the recordings that you actually put a mic on it. It sounds really loud on some of the recordings. But it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's a trademark for Eddie. Um, yeah, but you got to remember that when I was a young man, about five or a little older, my brother, my father would take us to record, and my brother would accompany me, and I used to sing. Yo cantaba en el barrio, you know, and I think. Then I got uh, 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 affected in my voice. And that's why I, I, I'm lucky I can still talk. But I used to sing. Oye, colega, no te asuste cuando vea el alacrán tumbando can. And my brother played, the, you know, and then my uncles would come down and put the guitar and sing. And those records, we, we don't have them anymore. But it was my brother who was able to accompany us all in anything. My brother was a genius when he did. Well, I want to ask you about um, some of the jazz players, the non-Latin players, who may have been on your radar, who, who you respect and may have listened to. Well, I never liked jazz. <laughs> I mean, I never liked it, because I, I, I didn't comprehend it. You know, on the cantar montun, on the cantar song, on the cantar you know, hey, no, 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 it's not a while, you know. And little by little, I realized que el género de jazz tenía su vaina, you know, it had its thing, you know. So naturally, uh, Art Tatum, you know, Thelonious Monk, which I eventually got to know, I met, and I want to do now a, a concert for him in Istanbul with Herbie Hancock, Queen Shorter, and I'm invited, wow. you know. Uh, I'll be playing a quintet with Pedrito Martinez, oh Annette Cohen, mm -hmm. another great, yeah. a great player, uh, Christian Scott, Lucas Curtis, we do a quintet, you know, and, and, and for uh, Thelonious Monk, because you remember the bass player Victor Venegas? Victor Venegas did a boat ride in New York, and everybody hated the boat ride. It was Sunday, you had to get up at 7 and be there at 9 in the morning, and by the time the boat got back, Everybody was drunk and they were fighting. And that, then that night we had to play the corso. <laughs> so Victor Venega bumps into Thelonious Monk and he brings him to the corso. And now in front of you know, Thelonious, he's saying, what a horrible boat ride. I mean, everybody hated this boat ride, but he was so funny. Everybody was hysterically laughing. And when we looked at Monk, he went, <laughs> 
and somebody said, boy, that story just killed Monk. He loved it. <laughs> <laughs> and he heard the band and he loved the band, you know, that. So I met him, naturally. And then, uh, who I respect so very much, Dr. Billy Taylor, who not only was a great jazz player, uh, pianist, uh, never got the respect, in my opinion, that he should have had, because he was so immensely talented in other things, being on CBS uh, TV, you know, uh, 60 Minutes. I mean, Billy Taylor, Dr. Billy Taylor was no joke. You know, one of my favorite players, uh, Bill Evans, Richard Thorzik, that was uh, discovered by Russ Freeman, all the jazz, Pacific Coast, like Bobby Timmons, which I knew and loved, and we met when he was with the Jazz Messengers, that we all wrote Morning. But little by little, I started to, to respect the jazz until one night, Barry Rogers in the Palladium, it had to be around 65, going on 66, he said, Eddie, uh, after we finished, we had to play four sets in the Palladium. He played 16 sets in four days for $72, and they took our taxes. <laughs> so you came out with 58, approximately, all right? He had an $18 scale a night, but you had to play the Palladium, you know? So, Mr. Hyman, he takes me to the Birdland, and I saw the original John Coltrane Quartet. Jimmy, Jimmy, Gar Gar uh, Garrison. Garrison, thank you. Uh, uh, Elvin Jomer, Elvin, Elvin Jones, my mentor, McCoy Tyler, which he was the one that just gave me my award at the at the uh, Masters, the uh, at the NEA, the yeah, Jazz Masters yeah, Award yeah, he, that Eddie just won recently, by the way, well deserved. But it was McCoy Tyner who gave it to me, my mentor. McCoy Tyner presented you with the Jazz Masters Award. Yeah, and then the, I was told, you're the only artist that got you know, an award, and you kept talking about some another artist. <laughs> because I just started to talk to McCoy, and he said, no, he's not well, he, he doesn't feel well. And I said, you are my favorite pianist. I've never seen anybody play the way you did in person, because the night that I went to the Birdland, it was not crowded, it was empty, and then I saw John Coltrane sit down after he soloed, incredible, incredible solo. And I don't know if he was figuring out the payroll or writing lyrics for Love Supreme, I don't know. <laughs> All I know is that five minutes went by, 10 minutes went by, 15 minutes went by, 20 minutes went by. I'm saying this at the at the NEA the over there. 25 minutes, and McCoy is just getting stronger. And and if anything belongs inside of an arrangement that excites us, when I learned it intuitively, then I learned it scientifically with my teacher, Bob Bianco. It's called, from Joseph Schillinger, the Russian scientist, Tension and Resistance. His solo of tension and resistance he got to such a climax. You have to have tension and resistance in all your compositions. If sex in danger of the excitement, the reaction of the human being is love and fear, that must be in the arrangement. There's four criteria that I learned from my teacher. He who knows not and knows he knows not can be helped. He who knows not and thinks he knows, that's a muddle head. <laughs> the third one is he who knows and knows not that he knows. My teacher put me there. Then the fourth one is he who knows and knows he knows is wisdom. Very few of us ever reach there, except for the philosophers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and the rest of the boys, you know. You know. <laughs> All right? But if anything, any iota that I have of wisdom, in my opinion, is that I don't guess that I won't excite you with my music. I know it. 
And that's because of that tension and resistance that will lead to an exciting musical climax. It's like centripetal force. You put a ball at the end of the string and it's just creating more and more energy. And that's when you go from a piano solo to a bongo solo conga, and that's creating more energy until you bring in the tuning of the band and that's gonna blow you away. And when you do that and you realize that in all your arrangements, you got yourself a deal. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great bit of advice. So, you know, I've heard uh, you and some, uh, some other el masters uh, in, in the music refer to that element in, in Afro-Cuban music, and particularly in the 40s, as a, there's a, a, a device that is used that I know that you use. You're probably the only artist that I know nowadays that, that does that. And I experienced that on stage with you at the uh, at Yoshi's a couple of years ago when I was so honored that you invited me to, to sing coro with you for a week at Yoshi's. And I got no, to then you play, there. You play bongo and you said, man, I'm going to take Anthony Carrillo's chair. No, <laughs> come on. And you did it. You blew it away. No, no, don't you even think that. Like, about that. But and I love the way you respect and love Anthony Carrillo because oh, he was here man. and you took care of him when he was here. So I always love you for that. Yeah. Thank you. You, but now what I want to refer to though, <laughs> I want to make mention of this uh, device because uh, also Orestes Vilato, who's a, who's a, a big, uh, a, a walking encyclopedia of traditional music, he talks about this a lot too. And I felt it for the first time on stage with your band when you were playing the La Perfecta material, the old material from the early 60s. And that is that the temples are not fast. The temples are, are slow, they're relaxed, so people could relax and not break into a sweat and get all frantic when they're dancing. And they go through the intro, go through the verses, and when it comes to the mambo or the montuno, where, the, where it steps up in the excitement, instead of doing the natural human thing, which is to speed up a little bit, you actually pull it back a hair, pull back the tempo a hair. And it's a, it's a rhythmic device that is incredibly powerful and makes the hair on, 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 the, on the back of your neck stand up. And we felt that in the audience, for some reason, Yoshi's, it was a, it's dance material, and Yoshi's did not set up a dance floor. Everybody was sitting, and it was not a Latino audience. It was a very mixed and mostly American audience. And the people, when, when you, each time that you got to that point in the music, you could hear, like, a feel a collective gasp in, in the audience. People could feel that, that excitement is created on a slow tempo that actually slows down. Uh, Can you comment on that a little bit, yeah, where because, that comes from? Because if, if you notice, even like when you hear Orquesta Aragón, for example, in Barona and Timbalero, when they do a break in the danzón, cuando va a meter el abanico, ese abanico está en la cabeza atrás, lo echa para atrás, tú sabes, tibi, 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 pa, and, and, and that's like, that's like, that is, that's magical to me. Yeah, it really is. You know, and when you work it out with yeah. the band, and, and then Manny Oquendo played that way too, yeah. because when Manny Oquendo cogía la campana, tú no podías echarte para adelante ni para atrás, esa campana estaba ahí mismo, you know. So I was very fortunate because of the personnel of La Perfecta. Remember, that rhythm section was the rhythm section of Vicentico, mm -hmm. Tommy Lopez. Manny Okendo, and then Manny Pettimbales, also Bongo. Then Bobby Rodriguez came in after with mm -hmm. David. Then, then David came later, David Paris. But Bobby, uh, Tito will not give him a $5 raise, so he drive, started to drive a taxi, and then I hired him. And Tito worked more than I, naturally, but uh, him being with us was my delight. You know, he was the greatest bass player that existed in New York City then. So La Perfecta was something to deal with. You know, it changed everything. Mm -hmm. It changed the format of a band in front. They never saw two trombones up front. They always saw trombones in a section. But also no trombone al frente with the flute and the singer, you know, and those eight uh, were put or hurt on any band that we played against. They really, 
didn't like us very much. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. It was amazing because it was a small group, and that's a kind of uh, layering in an orchestra that the arrangers create with a big band. With right. a big band, you have the section, the trumpets, you have the sax section start something, and you might have a couple of bones, and you have the trumpets out on top, and you layer. But to do that with a small group and have that excitement that, that, that created with a small group format, I think, shows the, the genius that you demonstrated at that time already. But it was, it was everybody knew their role. And Barry Rogers was quite eccentric. You know, he knew what, you know, what he... The what trombone he, player he, in the group. You know, he knew what we were looking for. He made it, he made it his business that the trombones had to be with Georgie, the front line. That, so we had the back, a, a number that Russ Freeman recorded, backfield in motion. We had the backfield in motion with <laughs> the rhythm. Manuel Kendall, Tommy, Bobby, and I, and the front line is, you know, the two trombones, flute, and, and it's mine. Barry sang corner, but when Barry went to do the trombones, then Georgie came and did the corner when he's my head. I mean, it, it was like, it was a chain reaction, you know, we didn't miss it. it Clockwork. Clockwork. All right. Well, I want to ask you one more question before we start with our blindfold test, and that is that you're w one of the many things that we have to thank you. Let me tell you something. When you start the blindfold test, I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things, one of the many things that we have to thank you for is um, what you have done for us, the percussionists. And, um, you know, I could say as a percussionist and as a percussion student for my whole life that nobody in the history of the music has given the percussionist as much play as you have on your recordings. You've always had the most incredible percussionist of all generations and always have a knack for bringing these new, young, great percussionists who would go on to become incredible musicians and influences. And, you know, nobody, even when I think of somebody like Tito Puente, who did a, also a great service by bringing the, the, the percussion to the front instead of in the back of the band. He did a great deal for the groups too. But even in Tito's band, they'd have their moments for the soloists, especially for him. Right. But, but, but you know, you took it to another place. And I remember being amazed and so thankful to see you every time that I would see you play live. You would, you have the habit of giving the percussionist a solo and taking the band off the stage and leaving the, the percussionist on the stage for, someone like Francisco <laughs> for 15 or 20 minutes or more, or more, 25 minutes, leave them on the stage, just go, go into town. And that's something that changed the nature of the, of the music and the nature of the instruments and the appreciation that the audience has for those instruments. But to me, the rhythm section since I'm a, a, a percussionist at heart, you know, is the pulse of life. The pulse of life. You know, it's look, that's the one that makes the mobility when you hear the music. That's the one that puts you to dance. You know, and the greater the percussionist, then you want to show his wares. If you're going to pay someone to be a company, you're not going to have them there just because, well, look, I got Giovanni Hidalgo there. Yeah, he prays with me. Just sit down and shut up. <laughs> no, you know, first of all, you can't do it to someone like that because he's gonna sprout out anyway. So then you you showcase him. You bring out his talent. Anthony Carrillo, when we saw Anthony Carrillo and Giovanni that I took to Europe, that was a, a marvelous show. Then I was saying, Ramini, with the three that played Mata, that man from Puerto Rico that brought three Grammys to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico had never received Grammys. Pablo Maruba was gonna be for Celia Cruz when we had a problem about Billy between her and I, unfortunately. Everything that she did was Celia and Billy, Celia and Dilly, Celia and Billy, <laughs> Willie and Dilly, Willie, whatever it is. And I told, you know, you know, she's the greatest artist that we have, but if she records for a while, no, that's gonna be any Palmieri, Soqueta, Cantando La, 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 you know, La Brava, Celia Cruz, and she wasn't gonna accept that, so we never did it. And then Palo Pajua wins the Grammy. It wins three Grammys, Solito and La Verdad, but that band, set a president in, in Europe, you know, and we left in 84, and remember that rhythm session, a young Giovanni. I mean, Giovanni did shows out there that you were really grabbing a bass drum. And then, you know, I don't have to tell you about Giovanni and these guys, you, you know them, you work with them, you play with them, you share the bands. 
Entry Carrillo, even Entry dice, pero tú no ves que él está loco, oye ese solo, y lo dije, y yo, but to me that's the pulse of life, and you want to show that to the audience, if the audience comes to pay to see something special, and you know you got something special there waiting for them, then showcase them and give them the greatest show that they could ever think they're going to see, in my opinion. Thank you for that. Yeah. One, uh, one uh, record, one, one, one recording that you made. I want to, I want to just bring attention to to, uh, to illustrate that fact. You have a tune on the Superimposition record. All of your records are. That's one of my favorite, by the way. Mine too. It's a you classic. know why? Because it's the, the the first band that changes from La Perfecta. And you know who was responsible for that? I may tell you, Nicky Marrero. Nicky Marrero, 17, 18 years old, he leads Willie Colon, comes with me, he brings with him and Andy, I didn't know Andy. Andy Gonzalez. And we had Eladio, which I, I knew Eladio because he had played with, with Tito Charlie, Puente, Tito. Uh, I mean, Tito Rodriguez, going uh, in Venezuela in 1967, going to uh, Rene Hernandez coming out of Puerto Rico. He comes to New York, so I knew Eladio. And then uh, and Chucky Lopez, who was 13 years old. That's when I put the three of them together, the age. So they divided by three, it came out to 17.1. <laughs> but I was smoking grass then. And then I did it again, and it came out to 18.6. <laughs> and I said, I better not smoke anymore. <laughs> well, that's precisely, you, you, you picked out, you intuited where I was going. There was a tune on that record, because those are the records that we wore out. We used to practice and play to those records, it was incredible. And they all had these beautiful classic percussion solos in, the, that's in, a chocolate in, in, in addition to the piano solos. But there's a tune on there that's especially <coughs> incredible with, with percussion solos, and the name of the tune is 17.1, and we never knew what that was. And when I, later I found out from Eddie, it's the average age of the three percussionists on the, on the record. It was Nicky Marrero, Eladio Perez, and Chucky Lopez. But uh, you, you've done that from the beginning. All the, all the greatest percussionists have played with you, Tommy Lopez, Manny Oquendo, Francisco Aguabella, and it goes on and on. Paoli, all the new generation. Francisco was great because in Francisco, when he used to come, he was with Peggy Lee, and he would come to New York, and then in Spanish, he would tell me, Cada vez que yo vengo a Nueva York, tú tienes problemas. Do you have a problem, you know? He said, but don't worry, after I finish with Peggy Lee tonight, they're going to talk Peggy Lee, they're going to talk contigo. So now we're playing in Harlem. And in Harlem, I'm playing in there with a guy called Lenny Adams, you know, with a friend of Rafi, heavy set promoter, and always giving me trouble with the money, you know, you know. Listen, give me my money, man. You know, no, man, I just give you an advance, I give it to him. No, I, I don't know about getting an advance, give me my money now, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm going to tell you what. All right, you're not gonna give my money? So then I go stay and then we play what you said, La Comparsa. And I stop the band. Y le digo a Francisco Aguabella, you know, no pare el tambor hasta que yo subo arriba. Don't stop that drum until I come back upstairs. And now I go downstairs and I meet the promoter, Lenny. I said, listen, I'm gonna tell you something. And you hear the place going crazy because Francisco giving a show up there. But <laughs> you know, what do you think? Don't let that drum stop. Because <laughs> you'll have a right there. Give me my money now. <laughs> and I get, he goes, oh, you see, you're always with your, oh, always with your, you know, you forget what he said, you know, you know, always with your bullshit anyway. Right, here's your money. I say, thank you. And I come up and say, Francisco, okay, tenemos los billetes, la coda, mambo, bam, and then we play the compas and get up and. It was Francisco. <laughs> he stood there maybe half an hour, 25 minutes alone. <laughs> and then they said, where are you going? To the, the promoter, where are you going? Said, oh, I'm gonna have a rum and coke. <laughs> and, watch, and watch the show. And Francisco, <laughs> and you know, Francisco could do it alone. He loved it. Oh, yeah. You know, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, time to listen to some music. So don't go nowhere. But uh, I want to play you some Good night, everybody. <laughs> 
I'm gonna play you just a couple things. And the, and okay. the idea is if you, you could come stop. Come on, go ahead, come on, come on. You could stop me at any time, uh, whenever you wanna identify who it is, or if you wanna comment on any of the players, or identify the players, whatever comment it, it inspires in you, okay? I'll get even. I know you will, I know you will. Here's the first one. I hope. the greatest pianist, he was, uh, Jose Cubello was the founder of the Riverside Orchestra, that's when she came, but she was so into jazz, just like Bebo Marte, y lo hicieron ellos en el género de jazz, en Pajimatarlo, y lo solo de Lee, con la Riverside, es cosa seria, okay. Indeed. A ver que diga, pero she, excuse me. Pero she. So let's listen to a little bit more of it because I want you to hear the percussion. No, oh, actually, speaking of Peruchin, what does Peruchin bring to mind for you? Peruchin was my brother's, one of my brother's favorite pianists. I learned uh, about the Riverside through my brother, one called Guempa, which is one of the great recordings. And, and at that time, La Oqueta sang coro. You know what I mean? And you hear it from the distance. Guempa, no te lo lleves todo. Pero Chi was into jazz, and dice que la, la, la hermana de Pero Chi, si lo puede decir en esto también, mm -hmm. tocaba un piano, ¿verdad? Sí, ella es cosa seria también. Pero Pero Chi tocaba este, un solo, un solo lentísimo, bien típico, y un talento único, y, y, a, y a mí me encantaba en la forma de peruchín, mm -hmm. tú sabes, y, uh, y él, a él lo, they asked him to come to New York to uh, be with the Machino band, and he didn't accept, and, but we were very fortunate that Rene Hernandez did it. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and after I just informed us this evening that uh, Peruchín's uh, sister was a great piano player. Was it Peruchín's sister or Lili? No, Lili's sister. Yeah, Lili también, Lili, la hermana de Lili. Peruchín's sister uh, played drums, I think. Uh, yeah, la hermana de Peruchín played timbal, or drums, but yeah. played piano too. Yeah. You know, no, no, see, you know. All right, let's move to another piece. I'm just gonna play it and you, you could stop me or make comment as you wish, of course. <laughs> Thank you. 
siempre sola sin que nadie comprenda tu sufrimiento tu horrible padecer fingiendo existencia siempre llena de dicha y de placer de dicha y de placer si yo Cuántas cosas secretas le contaría. Me lo dijese todo, todo, con su mirada. Un alma que al besarme, con su mirada. That is, um, a recording, it's a duo. The voice is uh, Francisco Céspedes, a Cuban, Pancho Céspedes. And the piano player is a young piano player. And it's really what I wanted to get you to kind of comment on. I didn't expect you to know what this is because it's, it's pretty recent and it's kind of an obscure recording. This is one of the greatest jazz players to come out of Cuba. His name is Gonzalo Urubancaba on the piano. Oh, yeah. oh, Gonzalo. And uh, I had the honor of... I know Urubancaba, but I, I didn't know that... that uh, when they did the record that he went, he went back to Cuba? No, that's done in 2006 here. That's done in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the great honor of... He did a album with Charlie Hayden. He sure did. Yeah. You know, and uh, he's amazing. He went to see me in, in Europe. We played together in a concert. He, Rubacaba, I, I met his father in Europe. He was Salito Rubacaba. is uh, is único in the forma que toca. He's an amazing player. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to mention that I had the honor also of meeting his father. His father was a, is a great player, still playing. He's close to 90 years old. And his father is uh, uh, Guillermo Rubalcaba, who right. used to play also, so made some classic recordings with Cachao back in the late 50s and with many artists. Maintains a typical charanga in Havana today. And I was very fortunate to meet him and go to his house and, and see uh, the photo album of a young baby uh, Gonzalito with his violin and stuff. Wow, and the really? gentleman who brought me, of course, to meet him and brought me to his house in Havana was none other, another than Ernesto Oviedo. <laughs> Uh, okay, next, uh, we, we listen and then we'll talk about it after. Dicen doa, al señor le dicen ser, al año le dicen yer, y su gramo de Linloa, al cuatro le dicen foa, al corre caballo yo, al pavo le dicen toki, 
y dicen gría, hay día y miedo, dicen la fría, a ratero piquipoqui. This is typical, as you know very well, no, this typical uh, Puerto Rican music known as Jibaro music. But I just want. Can you tell me a CD with the three brothers? Yes, you're talking Ramito, about Ramito, Moralito, and Luisito. Incredible, incredible. Well, well my uh, question for you is: is did, did you hear this? I'm assuming that you heard some of this music in your household, maybe at, when you were coming up. Yeah, uh, uh, excuse me, through my uncles. So they were always sing either tangos or that. And I, but not that much, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 for me, because for me, if when it got to the 50, era lo conjunto. I just wanted to know <laughs> first the bands in New York, then I dedicated my life to the music that was coming out of Cuba from, I would say, 56 to into the 60s until it all stopped, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, what we just heard is 1947 recording of Maestro Ladi, Ladislao Martinez is the cuatro player, the leader of the group, and the vocalist, the female voice is Ernestina Ramos, La Calandria, and the male voice, Jesus Sanchez, Chuito de Bayamón. So some, Chuito of, de Bayamón. some of the most famous jibaros. And I know that uh, most Puerto Rican families, uh, you, you can't escape that music because there'll be those records from the top artists like these you find in your parents and your grandparents collection, which happened with me, and that's kind of something that connects all the Puerto Ricans who are off of the island. Okay, no, no, it, it, that, that's the happening, you know, it, and, they, and they come up with some beautiful lyrics, you know, and the one that, like, Freddie really brought me, the one with Ramiro, there's three brothers, right? Right. And those three brothers have a CD that he brought me, killer. That's right. You know, then they go one-on-one -on -one against each other. Yeah, improvising with Desi yeah. us with, the, with yeah. the poetic form, the beautiful. Uh, those three brothers came here, actually. Moralito, Ramito, and Luisito, they came and played at the Puerto Rican club over here in Hayward back uh, many, many years ago. And uh, one of the brothers, Moralito, had just gotten his leg amputated. He had uh, wow. diabetes. And so the word got out that that had happened, so they thought that the concert would be canceled, and it was not. And he came, and he came in a wheelchair, and he improvised decimas about his experience, and he couldn't, he wasn't going to miss singing for his family and brothers over here, even though of what happened to him, he was singing about that. This, this style of music is, is one that has a lot of improvisation. And so it's one of the connections, I think, why, you know, going, making a left turn and going into jazz and the improvisation that exists in Cuban music as well, it's part of the traditions, the improvisational sure, sure. part is part of our tradition too. Mm -hmm. The piece, by the way, was called Un Jibaro en Nueva York. Okay. You know, it's like saying a hillbilly, a cowboy in New York City, and it talks about all the difficulties and complications in a very humoristic way. Okay, this uh, something a little more, I think, uh, uh, f f f uh, f familiar.
Yeah, yeah sure could. Yeah. yeah, that's the Tito Puente Orchestra with Candilo Camero on Conga Chino Pozo on the bongos, a piece called Tichi Can from 1967. Tito Pozo said he taught everything to Tito Puente. Who did? Chino. Who, who taught him? The, the, Tito Pozo always told me oh. when he played with me, que, uh, que Tito learned from him. Yo le enseñé a Tito. <laughs> Those are three of the great percussionists, of course, in, in uh, New York City. And Chino Pozo, I'm just curious to get your reaction about Chino Pozo. Well, Chino Pozo worked with me for a while. Unfortunately, he had a terrible accident when he played with me. And uh, then he landed up with Paul Anker. But he, he was born the same year as Chino Pozo. They're not related, mm -hmm. which I know you know. But Chino Pozo was an incredible, incredible percussionist. Uh, he, he recorded with Tito Puente, and uh, and then he went on, and then he was, he he was like quite, he always had his, a cigarette holder, you know, and then when he went with Paul Anka, then you couldn't even talk to him at all. <laughs> <laughs> but then he played with me, and then unfortunately he played a place in Brooklyn, so he, and there was a car accident, mm -hmm. and it smashed them all up, you know, mm -hmm. and then eventually he moves to Vegas, and he dies in Vegas. Well, the, the record that he recorded with you is one of the great ones, Justicia, from around that yeah. same time, 67, I believe, right? Justicia? At, at, at 69. 69. With Francisco Abella in a, in a recording studio called Incredible Sounds. There was no heat. Winter, so we had to use gloves to record. Morris Levy gave us like a punishment. And, uh, and little Ray Romero played on the second conga. David Hersher on bass, mm -hmm. to play with Orchestra Broadway, mm -hmm. Ismael, and the trombones, and that, and myself. Yeah, know. classic recording, Justicia. Uh, so I think we're gonna, I'm gonna thank you for listening to, to those pieces. Eddie? It wasn't too painful, right? I'll get even. <laughs> so at this time, we'd like to take a few questions from the audience, if you have any, for Eddie. Let everybody at once. <laughs> There's a question right there. Can you shout it out? Just say that one more time. Thank you. You mentioned the disintegration of the art of dance, and I was wondering briefly if you could. Did you hear that? You sounded that louder without the mic. <laughs> we still didn't hear it. No, just use the mic, but speak up. I was wondering. Ah. You briefly mentioned uh, the disintegration of the art of dance. And as a recent salsa dance addict, I was wondering if you could comment on that a little bit more. What you meant by that. Did you catch that? No. Good. Your, your, your comment, you made a comment about how the, the, the art of the dance has disintegrated. And she wanted, being a salsa fanatic, she wanted to just get a little bit more elaboration on that. Well, when. You see, the problem was that uh, when I played the Palladium Ballroom, we had the greatest dancers, in my opinion, in the world that would come to dance there. And the give and take between the orchestra and the dancers were the most unique scenario in that ballroom. The more the band, you know, synchronized and really went into a whole situation playing, the dancers went wild dancing, you know. It was, it was between the dancers and the band. I always called the dancers there the enemy, the real enemy. And that was because you wanted, you had to excite those dancers because those dancers would reflect and, and excite the orchestra watching them dance so, so great. The art of the dance has completely, in my opinion, has dissolved, except when you have what they call the Congre Congreso, the, you know, the thing of the Congreso, whatever the thing. But, and the reason that it's dissolved is because there's no orchestras to play the music that was played in the 50s and 60s. What you have is, a music that's either called uh, salsa sensua or whatever it is, that in my opinion, and not taking anything away or insulting any of the bands, but if you go dancing to one of those bands or one of those singers that it's just the vocalist alone singing that, 
I recommend you to buy two little mini pillows so you can put it on each other's shoulder because you're going to fall asleep <laughs> dancing to these non-exciting bands, which is, is the, the highest degree of a lack of respect to the orchestras, the way an exciting orchestra should sound doesn't exist anymore. I'm in a good mood tonight. <laughs> Can you take a question right there? You were talking earlier about you were talking earlier about when you were uh, coming up, and you played for some time, for some years before you met I forget his name, but someone that you felt was your your teacher, your mentor. Uh, and so my question is, uh, could you possibly give us a small idea of how you played before you met him and how that changed and, and then how you played after you learned from him? Uh, learned from who, though? I'm sorry. Maybe Bob Bianco? Oh, Bob Bianco, that was my, my mentor, yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, before that, uh, see, he took me to the world of jazz and uh, also to the world of Joseph Schillinger, which is a Russian math mathematician, that the Berkman School of Music was called the Schillinger House. Uh, but when the professor died at 47, his wife, that a gentleman called Artie Shore, uh, made it so difficult for them to negotiate that they refused to call it the Schillinger House anymore and they became Berkeley School of Music in Boston. But what I was able to learn from Bob Bianco took me into another world, you know, and uh, I was just so fortunate to have met him. Before that, I played with, like I said, Vicentico Valdez, but there was other bands before and then. But Vicentico was first, then Tino Rodriguez. When I made my own orchestra, then Barry Rogers recommended me Bob Bianco. Not only did he did we teach me the musical system of Joseph Schillinger, whatever I was able to comprehend, but the jazz harmonics of jazz, but he also took me into the world of Henry George. Henry George ran twice for mayor of New York City. He wrote his masterpiece book called Poverty and Poverty, and uh, that changed my whole life. The guarantee was I will never read the newspaper again, the same. I don't need to read the newspaper except I know exactly what's in that paper every day. Different names, but the same symptoms because we never eradicate the cause. There's a villain on the plot, and as long as we have that villain, we're gonna have these conditions that exist that makes it impossible for us, in my opinion, to live daily when everything is going around you is going up. Rent, food, gas, tolls and that, and wages tend to fall. So in that kind of a scenario, we haven't got a chance. And it's unfortunately that that exists, but that's another situation. And when I run for a political, I'm gonna run on a grass platform. You might as well get high and be high every day so you can put up with the conditions that exist. But thank you. I have to apologize to you because um, I, I let the time get away from you. We're running a little bit behind. And uh, part of the reason I think that um, Colleen probably assumed that I knew what time it was because I'm wearing this watch, but this watch doesn't work. <laughs> this watch is a watch that was a gift for me from my dad. It used to belong to my grandfather, and so I wear it for that reason, but it doesn't work. So I lost track of the time. But so, it, look, it looks good. Thank you. So what I would like to do, if we do have a few more minutes, is if we, with your permission, is, is, is uh, abuse the kindness of Mr. Palmieri one more time and maybe ask him to play a little bit for us. Everything positive I said about John Santos, I'm taking it back. What is <laughs> 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 
esté a Nueva York, si me da el honor de poder acompañarte con René o con... Hablamos de eso bastante. <risa> Yeah, because he's about to play the game. <coughs>